go back through the history of communication, you can trace some of these revolutions. We don't care what the message is. We will sell you access to the means of communication and you decide what you want to send. These are the organizations that create an environment of symbols that surround us. We have entered a new age, the age of communication exploration. Before us, a mediascape, a multi-layered information frontier with the power to draw us together as it frees us to be apart. An invisible web of connections touching every facet of our lives, our work, our schools, our homes. In this new world of communication, telephones, televisions and computers converge. A fusion that expands and splinters our concept of mass communication. The mass is no longer just those who read, watch, or listen. The mass can now broadcast its own messages. Out front, for those of us whose names are known in the history of television now, uh, the late John Chancellor. There have been stories from Washington, from the Atomic Energy Commission, hinting that the Russians may have resumed the testing of nuclear devices. David Brinkley. The whole situation is, of course, that the Vice President, Lyndon Johnson, will be given the oath of office as President of the United States as soon as it can be done. Chet Huntley uh, at, uh, at NBC. Uh, that would indicate, uh, just a sort of a snap judgment evaluation, that Governor Conley was worse wounded than the president. But as I say, that is only a snap judgment evaluation. At our network with CBS, uh, there was Ed Murrow with his uh, famous uh, uh, See It Now programs, uh, which were very important in setting the pattern for what later became known as investigative journalism. Now. Here is Ed Murrow. Good evening. Automation, in its simplest form, means one machine telling another machine what to do. From the time of the ancient Greeks, scribes meticulously preserved legacies of knowledge and lore of the ruling classes. For only they could afford the scribes and their tools. Through their painstaking artistry, knowledge flowed slowly and sometimes sparingly from the political and religious elite to the masses. Scriptoria were, just as you might think, groups of scribes sitting, taking dictation from somebody who sat in a chair rather like this one and read from a text. And it was a way of duplicating a text very rapidly. But as you know, if you've ever tried to take dictation, uh, and you have, let's say, 10 students in a room, no two copies are going to be quite the same. And you're taking it in by ear, so you're going to mistranscribe a good deal. Take nature shows, animal shows. You can see cougars and lions and the wolves and the bears of Alaska, and in a sense it lets you see animals that you would never in your life be able to see. And isn't that an advantage of television? Yes, I think it is. It clearly is. We're exposed to nature in a way that we wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. But those shows are highly unreal. If you actually spend time with a bear, most of what it does is sleep. But television doesn't show you a half hour of a sleeping bear. It's not terribly interesting. So they will film a bear for days. And then they will select out those relatively few moments in which the bear is reasonably awake, eating, chasing its cubs, you know, doing something cute. And that becomes the animal show. Is it real? Well, it really happened. But it's a very unrealistic slice of what an animal's life is like. And that's the dangerous piece. It's not seeing the bear. It's thinking that this is the way life is. We need to become conscious of the fact that television gives us a valuable, but a very narrow and, in a sense, artificially presented window on the world. In 1971, the New York Times 
was provided with a copy of a top secret government study uh, relating to how we got in the war in Vietnam. It was a historical study. And it went back many, many years, back to the 1950s. Uh, and it basically concluded that it was a series of errors within the government itself. The New York Times uh, broke the story, and the Nixon administration immediately went to court to seek an injunction to stop them from printing. That would, that's the first time that it ever happened in the history of the Republic. And it seems to me that that was a terrible outrage. If uh, democracy meant anything, it meant that newspapers, the First Amendment, were free to publish. But they decided, uh, then they were, they were uh, liable, if they had violated laws, violated national security statutes, to be uh, prosecuted. I represented the Times, and we argued to the courts there had never, ever been what's called a prior restraint, an injunction, a legal bar against a newspaper publishing news in American history. And we said that to the court in 1971, you shouldn't do that now. Uh, and the court, by a six to three vote, concluded that the Times and then the Washington Post was right, that they could not be uh, forced to stop publishing, and that they were free to continue to publish. The Pentagon Papers ruling is more important for the, the message it sends, for the music it has sent to the future. Uh, than uh, maybe even what the public got to read in 1971 about the war in Vietnam, because the message it sent was that the government really can't stop the press from saying what it wants to say, at least in advance. Most of what we talk about every day, most of what we see about the world every day is filtered through media. It's filtered through companies that, that basically construct worlds for us. It's not like these worlds are not true, but the worlds are constructed because of um, constraints, because of rewards that companies get, because of concerns that they have that are out there and that we have to know, we have to understand in order to be able to say, hey, we're, we're not going to totally be pawns of a, of a world we don't we know nothing about. Um, being an educated individual means being aware of how your environment gets created. And the media are such an important part of that environment, I can't imagine someone not wanting to know how the media world gets created. In the near future, it appears that media will continue to merge and grow and profoundly impact culture just as each new communications medium has in the past. By knowing the history of mass media, we are better able to understand how media impacts our lives and transforms society. <laughs>